talked about lipids before we left off, and we talked about two types of lipids. Um, if you didn't take the test yet, make sure you know the, the differences, the three differences between saturated and unsaturated uh, fats. All right, so now we're on proteins and nucleic acids. So proteins are the most diverse <clears throat> of those four molecules, carbs, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids. Proteins are the most diverse. They're extremely diverse. These are just st some examples. Um, we think When we think of proteins, like in our body, we, would, we might think of uh, hair and nails, but it's, it's, it's more than just hair and fingernails and muscle. Um, as they're showing you here, it's um, the hormones like insulin and hemoglobin that carries your blood and um, cell receptors and the pigment um, that colors your hair or skin. The reason your skin is curly or not curly, I mean, it's all because of uh, proteins. So... Um, antibodies, those are all, <clears throat> those are all proteins. So proteins are extremely diverse in your body and they're all made from, so I, I envision proteins as being like a chain and the links are amino acids. So proteins are made from amino acids. And if you look on one end of it, you will see a carboxyl group, which is called carboxylic acid, that doesn't really matter, but that's the carboxyl group, which is at the acid, and here it is on the right. And then on the left, here's the amino. So amino acid. The only, there's, there's 20 different amino acids and they all look like this. They have an amino end and an acid, like a carboxyl end. Just this part up here is different. Whatever this is up here is always different. Um, and you don't need to know all 20 of them um you just need to know that there are 20 different ones and then here you know they're just being put together so here's like one link in the chain here's another link in the chain and where they're they're like here they've been put together right and again dehydration right if you didn't take your first test yet dehydration when you put molecules together right so there's a loss of an of an OH on one end and an H on the other end, that water leaves, you're gonna slide these two together, right? So, <clears throat> so there's 20 different peptide bonds. The order that the 20 different amino acids are in are extremely important. If you get the order of amino acids wrong, then the protein doesn't work. So, there's 20 different amino acids, but the the protein itself could be, you know, 500 or 1,000 amino acids long. And if you just get one amino acid wrong, the order wrong, then it's really what it means is that it's not going to hold its shape. And the shape of an amino acid, I mean, the shape of a protein is very important. So the order that you put those amino acids is going to help determine the shape. And the shape... And if you look at this like a, on the right side, I know it's kind of this weird shape. It looks just like a, a ball, just like a knot that you can't get undone or like that. All your charger cords that are in your charger drawer from when you, have, when you had your Samsung charger, they don't even make those chargers anymore. Throw them out. But, I mean, that's what a, that's what a protein's like. It's like just that big, just mess of, of wires. Anyway, so it would look something like this, right? And let's say we just take this red area, right? This, this, and just move it a little bit. That's it. It doesn't work anymore. The whole protein is shot, right? So the order of amino acids helps to determine the shape, the shape of amino acids is determines the function of it. And if you change the shape, it doesn't work. 
Let me give you an let me give you an example. Um, this one. So on the left, you have red blood cells that are normally shaped. They're called biconcave discs. <clears throat> They're shaped like donuts, but the middle's not like punched out, right? The middle's still there. But anyway, these are sickled cells on the right. The, the protein that determines the shape of these blood cells are like, is like 500 amino acids long. And only one amino acid got changed. The sixth one just got slightly changed. So that was enough. Sorry, I'm pausing. My wife's doing classes also virtually. It's like, she acts like hers are the only classes. So I feel like she's going to come back here and ask me something, even though she knows I'm. All right. So anyway, the sixth amino acid is off. All right, and that's enough to <clears throat> that's enough to change the shape of it significantly. And you know, what does that mean? Well, one, these aren't going to carry oxygen that well, and two, not giving you the full look that I have, not getting the full look of what I'm feeling, because it's, it's going to be corded. All right, um. So some capillaries are like just big enough to hold one cell. Like they're wide enough just to fit one of these cells in them. So look at that, right? So these cells here, they're going to clog the, the capillary, the blood vessel. Plus they don't carry oxygen very well. And that's just because of one change, one amino acid different out of, out of all of them. So the shape of, of amino of proteins, there's different shapes. <clears throat> this is the, the, the most simplistic shape of a protein, and it doesn't really have a shape. It's just a bunch of amino acids put together. And this is just called the primary shape. Um, that's it. No shape, really. It's just like a, a chain with, you know, a bunch of links making the chain, and the chain is just kind of hanging there. However, you can start to get some more complicated shapes of proteins. So this is the secondary shape of a protein. And you'll see that it's on the left here, it's coiled up. So it's like a staircase, right? And so we call that a helix or, or an alpha, whichever one you want. That little A sign's alpha, and then that B sign is beta. On the other, the one on the right is called a pleated sheet. So the one on the right is called a pleated sheet. And it's just like a piece of paper that's been folded. We think of like pleats in, in pants. So that's what, what, that's what that shape is. There being these shapes, this staircase shape, this coil shape, or this shape, you see these three dots and notice the three dots are between the, an H on one end and an O on the other end. So that's a hydrogen bond. <clears throat> so hydrogen bonds are holding this shape. Hydrogen bonds, as far as, as bonds, as atomic bonds go, they're not like the strongest ones, right? They're pretty weak. So it's, this can be, um, you know, these bonds, these hydrogen bonds can be broken with like a high temperature or an acidic environment, and that could change proteins. It could change the shape of a protein. But anyway, this is the secondary structure. The third structure, tertiary, I'm going to really just do it like this. This is, even though this says quaternary, let's just leave it with tertiary. And tertiary just means three. 
I'm excited. I got a message here. You only, oh, thanks. You only, you don't see the PowerPoint. You should be. Okay. No, I don't. I don't see the PowerPoint. You don't see the PowerPoint. Are, are any, are any others of you having the problem? <clears throat> no, I can see it. So if you can't see the PowerPoint, um, I think maybe you can go and like pin the screen. Okay, I got it. All right, thank you. Oh, no problem. Um, so we'll just have, we'll just, just imagine three shapes. Cause like, four, well, let me show, maybe I can, there you go. Cause four shapes is kind of stupid, but the first, the primary structure doesn't have a shape. Secondary can look like these two. Tertiary is a combination. That's like the big knot of charger cables. It's in your drawer, <clears throat> right? That's that's a more typical shape of proteins. Very, um, you know, very complex. I forget about quaternary. It's stupid. But tertiary is kind of a combination of the other two. Denature is whenever this shape is changed. So holding the shape, what holds the shape of proteins are a lot of things. Hydrogen bonds hold the shape of proteins. Here's an ionic bond helping to hold the shape of a protein. And then disulfide bridge, which is using sulfur, like sulfhydrils, that's help, helping to hold the shape. So there's lots of things that hold the shape of a protein because it's all you know it's just all this jumbled mess so there's lots of these interactions these bonds that are in there are holding this particular shape so it's it's possible for to have it um denature when you cook an egg that's what you're doing like <coughs> The eggs kind of like the egg white is clear. <coughs> the egg white is clear. And then when you start cooking it, it turns white. It's because as soon as you heat up that egg white, you're breaking all the hydrogen bonds. So you're denaturing the protein. You're changing its shape. And that's all that denature means. Okay, so that's proteins. And now we're on nucleic acids. So for nucleic acids, at least for right now, we're just going to talk about DNA and RNA. And there is a whole chapter on this, so I'm just kind of giving you a um, just a quick overview of DNA and RNA. So we haven't talked about some of this yet, but the proteins, proteins are made inside of a cell. And in the cell, you have these ribosomes. They make proteins. And you see here, they're making proteins out of amino acids. So there's like amino acids all around inside the cell. And then we, the, the, the ribosome just takes each amino acid and sticks it on another one until it makes the protein. So here's like the protein at the other end here. So here's like the amino acids going in, and here's the protein coming out. Question is, how does the cell know what order to put those amino acids? <clears throat> and the answer is that it's in the DNA. So this DNA, which is inside the nucleus of your cell, so here we're talking about your like your genetics and stuff. The DNA has the code, has the information for what order we should put those amino acids in. <clears throat> Nucleic acids like DNA or RNA, in fact, that's what the NA stands for. So when you have DNA, it stands for, the NA stands for nucleic acid. And then that's what the D stands for. So it's deoxyribose nucleic acid. I don't care about that really, what it stands for. But I do want you to know that nucleic acids are made from nucleotides. Here's that word down here at the bottom, nucleotide. <clears throat> so there's three parts to a nucleotide. 
It's actually right here. There's a sugar and a phosphate. And if you notice, they're alternating. Sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. This is like the backbone of the nucleic acid, sugar, phosphate, just alternating. Then here in yellow, there are different bases. So there's these nitrogenous bases. And for DNA, there's four of them. And they're right here. And you don't have to know the names for right now. In fact, we just use, we, we usually use the letters. So forget about uracil. That's only in RNA, but there's these four here. And that's going to be here. So if you look here, this will be like adenine, cytosine, thionine, thymine, you know, guanine, whatever, cytosine, cytosine. They're just a bunch of different ones. And this, so let me see. All right, here we go. Here's like a different picture of it. So if you look here, this is sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, all the way down. So that's one strand of the DNA. And this is sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate. This is the other strand. What we really care about here is the bases. So if you look at the bases, you see the letters. Adenine, cytosine, cytosine, thymine, cytosine, whatever, adenine, adenine. It keeps going. Right? And so this thing will be millions of bases long so millions of letters long you know a typical gene could be like 10,000 plus just for one trait so like let's say the trait that makes your hair curly or straight it could be 10,000 100,000 of these long right that's a code each three of these letters ACC, that's a code for one of the amino acids. AGT, that's a code for another amino, another one of the 20 amino acids. GAA, that's another one. So every three letters is a code for one of the 20 amino acids. I mean, obviously, there's only 20 amino acids, right? But there's more than 20 combinations of these letters that you can come up with. So... Each amino acid has many different letters, and and we're not going to deal with it in this class. But just know, like, for example, ACC would be for, like, tryptophan, right? But also ACG and AGT and ATT, right? So there's lots of combinations. But your body, what your so this is what DNA looks like. So it has two strands. So it's got that one strand that, that really counts that your body's going to read from, and then it's got this other strand. I, I imagine it being like a, like a ladder. And so the ladder has the part that you climb up, that you put your, your hands in your feet and you climb up. That's the bases, right? That's the two base pairs across from each other. And then you have the parts on the side of the ladder. That's just the sugar phosphate. That's like the backbone. So... Um, so why does DNA have two strands? Well, if you notice here, every time there's a T, there's going to be an A. So they always pair up. Wherever there's an A, there's going to be a T. And T and A, they always pair up. Same thing with C and G. C and G always pairs up. So the other side is kind of a reverse. So... If I know one side, I already know what the other side is. So I just come down here and I'm like A, C, C. Well, I know the other side is then going to be T, G, G. Because A and T always pair up and C and G always pair up. So what your body does, we have two strands of DNA. Only one strand is important to read. The other strand is there because when we go to divide our cells, we're going to make a copy of, of the DNA. So that's what's happening down here in yellow. So like the DNA kind of unzipped and the body's making like another strand of each. So now you have two strands that look exactly the same. Oh, yeah, good. That's the end of the slideshow. So takeaways from that. Um, the of nucleic acids. Um the takeaways are nucleic acids are made from 
nucleotides. And nucleotides are made from three parts, sugar, phosphate, and base. We never talked about RNA, but RNA is looks like this, but it's a single strand. It's only like half. It's like half of the ladder. Um, we'll, we'll deal with that in another chapter. Um, part of me wants to deal with it right now so I could talk about the new RNA vaccine, but no, I'll stop myself. Let me go into the next chapter. Any questions on proteins or nucleic acids? I really didn't give you a lot of information on nucleic acids. All right, let me jump into, all right, so <clears throat> we're done with that. We've got like one more chapter and then we can actually move into biology, which this whole time we haven't done anything on biology yet because biology is about things that are living. We haven't talked about any living things yet. We've just been talking about, we started off with chemistry. Now we're talking about molecules. So, um, you know, now we're going to talk about metabolism. Then finally by next class, we'll get into um, things that are living. So if you didn't take your exam one yet, that's not going to be on today's lecture. So this all goes on quiz two. So um, carbohydrates, lipids, that's on the exam, exam one. This is, um, this is all going on quiz two. So metabolism. Metabolism is a, like the sum of your body's chemical reactions. It's all the chemical reactions that happen in your body. Well, that's kind of a vague statement. Your body's pretty much doing one of two things. It's breaking something down or it's building something. And that's it. Your body builds stuff and it breaks stuff down. So that's kind of summed up here. Catabolic reactions and anabolic reactions. If you think about anabolic steroids, what do they do? Anabolic steroids build muscle, right? So you, maybe that'll help you remember it. So anabolic reactions build things. So when you build muscle, you need energy. When you build hair, you need energy. Anything that you build, anytime you take two smaller molecules and put them together, you need energy to do that. So this chapter is really about energy. And by the way, metabolism, there's kind of two definitions of it. Um, the strict definition is, is all your chemical reactions that happen in your body. <clears throat> in nutrition, we tend to say, well, metabolism is like how many calories you burn. And that's sort of right, but this is really the definition of metabolism. It's all of your anabolic and catabolic reactions. So you're breaking up what food usually that's the thing that we're breaking up. So we break up food and when we break up a molecule that releases energy. So we're going to take the energy that we get from food by breaking up food and we're going to use it to build things like build more muscle, make new skin, make antibodies, make hair, whatever you're going to make. So definitely, definitely know the difference between catabolic reactions and anabolic reactions, which I have it right here in front of you. Because I'll ask you. Don't just say breaking up molecules. I mean, yes, but this is a chapter that's about energy. So don't forget the energy part. When you break up a molecule, you've released energy. It's what you're doing with gasoline. You're breaking up the hydrocarbons and that's releasing energy. <clears throat> that energy is used to make your car drive, right? So you're taking energy that was in gasoline, you're catabolizing it, you're breaking it up with flame, and now that energy is getting transferred into making your car move. So anyway, 
I just explained to you the first law of thermodynamics. So energy can be, there's lots of different terms, but really potential versus free is kind of an interesting one or, or a relevant one for this lecture. Potential means it's available. I mean, it's, uh, it, you know, just what it says, it could be potential energy. Better to give you an example. Oil in the ground is potential energy. Gasoline in your car is free. I'm comparing the two. So oil in the ground versus gasoline, oil's potential energy, gas is free energy, meaning it's available. <clears throat> that can do work for me. So um, there's more energy found in things that are unstable. So to go back to this first slide here, you see water in a dam. That is much less stable than if we were to not have the dam and just let the water flow in the river, right? Having Just letting the water flow in the river, that would be much more stable. This is much more unstable, but we could take this and make energy with it. There's more energy in the water that's in the dam. Or if you think about a spring, a compressed spring, that's not as stable as if you just leave the spring decompressed. But there's more energy in a compressed spring than a decompressed spring. So, yeah. That's what, when you have the hammer of a gun cocked, like when the gun's, when the hammer's back and it's ready to go, it's a compressed spring, right? The gun's more stable in what state? When the hammer's in the normal position or when the hammer's cocked back? When the hammer's cocked back, that's unstable. But there's energy there now. I just pull the trigger and that's going to decompress the spring. Maybe a bad example, but. Um, so the first law of thermodynamics, you definitely need to know. And that, that guides metabolism. Energy's not created. It's not destroyed. It's transferred around. The energy that's moving your car used to be gasoline. That gasoline used to be oil. That oil used to be dead dinosaurs. Those dead dinosaurs used to eat smaller dinosaurs. And I learned this from Jurassic Park humans. And then those smaller dinosaurs and humans ate plants and those plants got their energy from the sun. It's just a transfer of energy from one thing to another thing to another thing to another thing, right? And so that's, um, that's the first law of thermodynamics. Energy just gets transferred around. The second law of thermodynamics is that not all energy, well, this isn't the second law of thermodynamics. This is me trying to make it uh, simple or simplify it because it talks about the entropy of the universe and whatever. So I tried to make it simple here that, that not all of the energy that will go into its intended purpose. And let me give you an example. <clears throat> um, gasoline driving your car. Only about 25% of that gasoline actually makes your car move and powers your air conditioner and your radio and stuff like that. The rest of the gasoline, that energy is actually lost. It, it, it's lost as heat. So your engine gets hot and that heat just escapes and it just goes out, right? Did you see my uh, question? No, I'm sorry. Cause you could just jump on and just say it anytime. Um, I had asked, what about uh, the, the energy from connecting the light poles though? Oh, I'm so happy because I'm so happy to get a question. Um, I get so bored talking to myself. So where did that come from? The energy like that? That's connecting the light poles because like when let's like the, 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 the light poles outside, like if I turn on my light, right? That's yeah. connecting, that's connecting the energy to my house. Correct. Yeah. So where that energy coming from? Yeah, good. So what company makes it? 
uh, energy. And I, I don't remember exactly how they make it here. If it's like nuclear or let's say they make it from like diesel, right? They've got like the energy plant has like these big diesel engines and they're, they're burning diesel and they're running these turbines to make electricity. And then they send the electricity down the, the wire. Oh, okay. The energy that's, that's powering the street lamp or the light in your house, or let's say the energy that is in the battery in your phone used to be electricity from Entergy. Entergy made the electricity because they were burning like gasoline, like diesel. They were burning fuel to make it. And then that, of course, that fuel just keeps going back. How did we make the fuel in the beginning? You know, we, we made it at some kind of, um, some kind of refinery. We took oil and we refined it and made it into diesel. So before it was diesel, it was oil. Before it was oil, it was in the ground. Before that, it was like dead dinosaurs. So all of our energy pretty much comes, we can trace our energy back to something that used to be living. And that's essentially what we're doing, or something like coal. So... Um, but every time you transfer energy, like when energy makes electricity, they lose some of that energy. When we charge our phone from electricity in the wall, so now you're, take, you're taking electricity and you're storing it in a battery to use for your phone, you lose some of that. You're not getting 100% of the energy from the wall going into your phone battery. You lose some every time you transfer it. So every time we, we convert energy from one form to another form, we lose a little bit of its efficiency. Like it's not the 100%. So um, <clears throat> and that, that part's the second law of thermodynamics. Right, so putting gas in our car, we've lost some of it as, as, as heat. Yeah, but um, and electricity, by the way, it's what, I mean, the name kind of tells you they're electrons. They're just electrons. So, um, you know, you have a big generator and it's just generating electrons. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, this was, this was the gas thing I was going to tell you that, you know, it's lost, it's lost as heat. Someone that studies physics will say, no, it's not lost. But we consider it lost, like I do. It's not making my car go. It's just get, getting lost as heat from my engine. But someone that studies physics will say, no, it's going somewhere. It's, it's doing something in the world. But I don't know. So this is where we get energy from. We get it from when we eat food. We're eating. If you think about everything you eat, it's going to fall into one of these three categories, carbs, lipids and proteins right so i had um i had captain crunch which is not my usual go-to for breakfast but i was in a hurry to get in the class so i ate captain crunch carbohydrates it's made from corn so it was starch that's a carbohydrate and then of course it's super sweet any sugar is a carbohydrate so that was carbs the captain crunch cereal itself that was just pure carbohydrates then I, um, I, pu I poured milk in it. That was milk has fat in it, so that's a lipid. And then, of course, milk has lactose. Now you know lactose. That's a carbohydrate. So, and then if I ate something like eggs, egg whites, I'd be like protein and, you know, something like bacon would be a protein. But anyway... All the food you're eating can be broken down into carbohydrates, lipids, or proteins. However, we have to convert all of that over into ATP. I think of it as like the energy currency of the body. I think of ATP as like dollars. And I think of carbs, lipids, and proteins as like foreign currency. So carbs would be like Canadian dollars and proteins would be like euros and lipids would be like Mexican pesos. It's money. If someone gave you 500 Canadian dollars as a gift, you'd keep it, right? You wouldn't just throw it away. 
you can't do anything with it. You got to like take it somewhere and get it converted into dollars, but it's, it's going to be a few hundred dollars, right? So it's money, right? It's just that you have to convert it before you can use it. That's what our body has to do with carbs, lipids, and proteins. There's only one exception to this. Your brain uses glucose. In fact, now something's in my eye. Your brain uses glucose. That's the only exception. But everything else pretty much in your body uses ATP. So ATP is the molecule. Fuck, I got to shut my... All right, I'm scratching my eyes, so I don't want you to see. ATP is the molecule that um, that powers everything. If you want to grow hair, ATP. Me talking to you right now and moving my hands, ATP. Everything we're doing, ATP. We're, we're using ATP. Right? How did we get the ATP? We got that from our food. We took the the electrons off of our food and we use those electrons to make ATP. It looks like this. Don't worry about the molecule, right? Because it's not really what we care about. But um, so you have this mo molecule called um, adenine. So ATP stands for adenosine which that, that word's not as important here. The important word here is triphosphate. Tri means three, and phosphate, phosphate groups. So remember, that's one of the functional groups. So here in yellow, there's one phosphate, there's another phosphate, there's another phosphate. That's the part of this molecule that we care about. This part of the molecule, so what? Right. Um, it's there, but it's not. You know, it's what we care about is these three phosphate groups. So this whole, and look down here, this is the a better, a more simplistic view of the molecule. This is ATP, adenosine triphosphate, three phosphates. This last phosphate is the most unstable. So this first phosphate has no problem being attached to the molecule. This second phosphate Sorter doesn't want to be attached, but this third phosphate out here is unstable and it really, it really does not want to be attached. Um, so your body has to use a lot of energy to hold, hold on to it. It's like, you know, like in the playground, you have those, um, that thing that spins around. Some of you. Younger people, I bet, have never been to a playground. <laughs> Just kidding. But there's like that thing that spins around, and some kids like get right in the center where it's turning around. But some kids that are more daring, they go grab the outside of it and they hang off of it, right? It takes way more energy if you're on the outside of it. You have to like really hold on tight because you're getting spun around. But that kid that always plays it safe, it's in the middle, right in the middle there. That kid doesn't really have to hang on that tight, all right? It's kind of like that with this molecule. That one on the end really has to use a lot of energy to hold on. And it falls off. So in this scenario, you've got kids flying off of that machine. So this third molecule, this third phosphate, comes off all the time. We'll put it back on, and it's going to break off. We put it back on, and it breaks off all the time. That's the... That's how this molecule works. This last P breaks off, and that P, whatever it ends up touching, it transfers its energy into it. So here we are over here. We have this P that broke off. They've put a little I next to it. I don't care about the I. But here's the P. Now, we have a molecule here that's no longer tri phosphate it's not three it's only dye meaning two because the third one broke off so it's not adenosine triphosphate it's just adenosine diphosphate or we call it adp because it's only two now that third p is going to go somewhere else in your body where wherever it goes it will give energy for example if you want to move your muscle 
that P is going to touch your muscle. And that's what makes your muscles contract. That's what's making your hand move or your eyes move. The little P's are touching it. If you want to make hair grow, little P's touch your hair follicles, and that's what gives the energy to make your hair grow. So whatever that P touches, it transfers the energy into whatever that thing is, right? And then later on, later on, we're going to put this P back on. We're going to attach it. We're going to reattach it and make more ATP. And of course, that P is going to break off again, and then we'll reattach it later. So this is like another way to say that. Right, so you put these two together to make ATP. Then it's going to break every time it breaks apart. You're taking ATP and you're breaking it apart. You're taking one molecule and you're breaking it into two. That's catabolic reaction. You're taking a larger molecule and you're breaking it into smaller ones. That's catabolic. You've released energy. Then when you want to put those two molecules back together, that's anabolic. So you need energy to do that. This is just saying, this is kind of happening in my body. I put sugar in my coffee. I finished my coffee now. That sugar is inside of me. My body is going to start to hydrolyze that sugar, break it apart. And if you remember from the carbohydrate, sugar is made from sucrose, which is table sugar, is made from glucose and fructose. Right. So my body right now is breaking the sucrose in half so that so that it can enter my blood but when i do that i've re, I've, I've released some energy when i break the sugar up i've released some energy so the important thing to know here is and i should have written it down somewhere <clears throat> the formula is ATP is broken up into ADP plus P. So ATP is broken up into ADP plus P. You can take the ADP and put it together with the P and make ATP. So I can put these two together to make ATP. But it also works the other way. I can break up ATP to make these two. Both of these reactions are happening right now in your body. Both of them. You're breaking up ATP. You're making ATP. You're doing both. How can we make ATP? Like where do we get the energy to make ATP? We get it from carbohydrates and lipids and proteins. So right now I'm breaking up that Captain Crunch. I'm going to make like blood sugar and glycogen. I'm going to have energy. Eventually, my body's going to take the electrons off of that Captain Crunch, whatever's left of it, and I'm going to use those electrons to put ADP and P together. So I'm going to take my breakfast, and I'm making ATP with it. Later on this afternoon, or later on today, I'm going to take that ATP that I'm making right now, and I'm going to break it up, and I'm going to do stuff. I'm going to walk around the house and... I'm going to sit in my chair and watch Amazon Prime or something. It takes energy. I have to breathe. So there, that takes energy. I've been watching The Boys. And if you've never seen it, it's not, sounds like a stupid show. It's not. It's a cool show. You should watch it. All right. So every reaction that we have <clears throat> has an enzyme that, and this is the last part of this lecture, every reaction, every catabolic or anabolic reaction has an enzyme. So anytime I want to break something up, anytime I want to make something, I need an enzyme. And an enzyme, there's a strict term of what an enzyme is, and then there's like a more realistic term. So the... The, the strict definition of an enzyme is that an enzyme speeds up 
chemical reactions. So if you ever see, forget about my class, but if you see someone talk about an enzyme like on a placement test, like the HESI or something, or the T's, whatever you guys are going to take, remember that an enzyme speeds up chemical reactions. It's called a catalyst. It catalyzes chemical reactions. However, in reality, it makes the reaction happen. If I want to break starch up, like I eat a piece of bread, right? I'm going to physically break up the bread with my teeth and stuff, right? And I'm going to liquefy. I'm going to turn it into liquid starch, right? But that's not good enough. That starch will never make it into my bloodstream. The starch is too big. The molecule's too big. It won't fit. I can't get it in past my cells because it's just too big of a molecule. I've got to make it a small, tiny glucose molecule. That's, that's what's going to go in my blood. So I need an enzyme to do that. So I've got enzymes. I've got an enzyme in my body called amylase, and it that's what it does. So if I didn't have that enzyme, it would take me two years for my body to break down starch. Two years. It's not going to happen, right? Because I'm going to get rid of it tomorrow, one way or the other. I mean, I'm, I'm, that's it. I'm getting rid of it. I'm not going to keep it. So it'll never happen. Without the enzyme, my body doesn't have two years. So I'm 50. My body doesn't have two years for anything. So, um, But with the enzyme, it takes like two minutes. That's how much fast. That's how quickly enzymes work. That's like the difference. You're talking between two years and like two minutes. So when we say speed up a reaction, we're talking about, you know, millions of times faster. So really, like practically speaking, if you stop an enzyme, you're stopping something from happening. And a lot of medicines work exactly that way. A lot of pills do that. They stop enzymes. They inhibit enzymes. So... Uh, and you'll learn about that because you're going to probably learn about pharmacology, how medicines work, and a lot of it has to do with stopping enzymes. Or hormones, what do hormones do? They, some of them activate enzymes, get enzymes working or not working because by messing with enzymes in your body, you can make your body do different things or, or not do things. So enzymes make things happen, but... Technically speaking, enzymes speed up a chemical reaction. The enzyme in this photo is red. And the substrate, the thing that the enzyme is going to work on, is blue. So pretend that, that, that this is starch in blue. And the enzyme is called amylase. By the way, the, the, when you see a word that ends with A-S-E, it's going to be an enzyme. So I'll give you an example. Sucrose. This word ends with O-S-E, so it's a sugar. Because I know when I see a word ending with O-S-E, it's going to be a sugar. But I know that the enzyme name for this is called sucrase. So it's the exact same word. It's just with A-S-E. So because I see it's A-S-E, I automatically know it's an enzyme. So when I see that at the end of a word, I know it's an enzyme. And then, of course, because it's sucrase, I can guess. I'm going to guess it's, it's an enzyme that breaks up sucrose. But anyway, um, this would be sucrase, and this would be sucrose. So sucrase is going to come in here. The substrate is sucrose, sugar, and it's going to break it. It's going to break it in half. And then it's going to go to an, it's going to find another one, break that in half. Then it's going to find another one, break that in half. Oh, the whole picture on it. I hate when I do that. Like, I forget the slides that I chose to use. Anyway, like this, right? The purple, oh, the purple's the enzyme, right, okay. So anyway, you don't need a whole lot of enzymes. An enzyme will do more, um, the enzyme will go too many substrates. So the substrate is whatever the enzyme is working on. So in this case, the substrate is sucrose. <coughs> and it just goes around and breaks it up. And that's the end of the slideshow. So 
ATP, there, we have a whole other chapter on this. I'm going to stop this lecture. We have a whole other chapter on how ATP is made. That's going to be chapter nine. So we have a whole chapter just on that, how your body takes food and takes that food and makes ATP. So you remember how ATP is broken down and how it's formed again. And I have a whole other video on this. It's, it's relatively short. It's probably like 10 minutes. So I would um, definitely suggest that you watch it. All right. Do you guys have any questions? I'm going to stop recording here.